Hi, my name is J.P. Haas. I'm uh, one of the musculoskeletal radiologists at uh, University of Nebraska Medical Center. Welcome to uh, MSK MRI 101, Protocols, Reading Patterns, and Reports. And this is going to be the shoulder session. Um, most of this is going to be focused on trying to create a uh, very high yield beginner's approach to reading a shoulder MRI when you first start in the bone room. Um, I like to use what's called the checklist pattern. Uh, I think it's the best way to uh, just be very regimented and uh, structured when you uh, are learning how to read uh, shoulder MRI and you just go down the list and look at every single structure you want to see and then um, go from there and from there you can make your report. Uh, so I'll do a, just a little bit about what we do on protocols here uh, and then from there we'll have uh, some scrollable images uh, mostly emphasizing normal anatomy and, uh, and also showing some pathology as well. So with that we'll try to get started. Um, just a couple uh, comments here. Uh, there's different ways you can report shoulder MRIs. Uh, at this institution, we tend to use uh, freehand reporting. So most people just look at their findings, have their reading approach, and just dictate into the microphone. Template reporting is also very uh, useful. Uh, and I'll show some templates that are uh, good for shoulder uh, MRIs. Um, I'll uh, have a, the checklist uh, sheet, and I'll try to make that available to you as well in Word document, because I think it's really good, uh, like I said, especially when you're starting to just have that right in front of you, and you can just go down the list and make sure you're looking at everything you want to see. I've tried to actually make that also uh, kind of a readable document that says, okay, look at this, uh, look at this uh, uh, plane, and then, you know, and then also look at it on this plane, so, and then I'll, we'll kind of go over how that goes. Um, and at the, end of the, at the end of this, there's a scrollable normal uh, study where if you want to uh, use the PowerPoint uh, and just to look for things on your own, that's going to be available to you as well. Uh, this is our main protocol that we use. Uh, it's a uh, six sequence uh, study. Uh, it ha it's a very broad, uh, has a very broad application that we use for general shoulder pain. Um, and it's these sequences we show here. Basically, it's uh, three planes of coronal, an axial, a sagittal, and an oblique plane. The oblique plane is uh, uh, something that I've noticed that is, uh, I, I think, fairly unique to this institution, uh, and I'll show you why we like that. But I put it uh, here uh, just to kind of show you um, what, it, what exactly it is. But basically, uh, the, the, one of the main ideas is that uh, it cuts the glenoid from anterior inferior to posterior superior. So there's certain structures on it that show, show it very well. Um, for example, the posterior superior labrum is one place I really like to look at on that sequence, and I'll show you what that is once we get to the actual scrollable images. Here's our shoulder arthrogram protocol. Uh, this is a, a study we do if we're going to inject contrast into the joint uh, to try to look at certain structures better, especially cartilage, cartilage especially labrum. Um, and since we do have that gadolinium, gadolinium on board in the joint, we use what's uh, especially these uh, T1 fat saturated images, uh, which will show that, that uh, T1 hyper intense contrast in those uh, small spaces of the joint that we want to see if there's any abnormality. Um, but otherwise, it has uh, you know, fairly similar uh, planes to uh, what we do for the non-contrast shoulder MRI. The one, at least at this institution, that we'll always put on is the Abe view as well. Uh, I've shown a picture of how we actually get that, uh, where it's abduction and external rotation. Um, one of the main ideas behind getting this is especially to tighten that anterior capsule of the shoulder to show those anterior labral tears better. Uh, probably the uh, most important utility for that, for that sequence. As far as uh, template reporting goes, uh, here's an example of what a uh, structured report could look like. As I said, uh, here we use mostly freehand dictation. Um, now, with that being said, I'm going to go forward one slide slide forward here and show you that uh, here is an example of uh, what we have in our own power scribe shells of what a uh, kind of a more freehand style but still gets all the information across um, template reporting can be so if you're interested in that and you're here you can uh, find that in one of the uh, msk staff's power uh, uh, power scribe uh, templates here's a, a, a more important slide than i you know maybe take for granted um, I think it's really important when you're first starting to read just to think about how you're going to look at the study. Um, you, you know, even how many screens do you have in front of you? How are you going to subdivide those screens? Uh, where are you going to put your comparison exams? Uh, and just being consistent about that and, and doing it always in the exact same approach, I think is super helpful and, and, and uh, underappreciated. So uh, with that being said, this is how I like to lay out the shoulder MRI in packs. Uh, across the top, I'll put my coronal T1, my coronal PD fat sat, my coronal T2. So I have all those across the top. Um, and then across the bottom on six, uh, six screens, I'll have uh, my axial PD fat side, my oblique PD fat side, and my sagittal T2. Uh, so that's basically everything I'm going to need to look at for the most uh, current study that I'm actually interpreting. 
Uh, if I do have another couple screens over here uh, is where I'll start putting off my uh, my comparison exams if I need them. Um, I, you know, I probably tend to hang up almost the entire comparison exam if I if I actually have one. Uh, but especially whatever you think you're going to use. I mean, it, those those kind of conventional coronal axial sagittal planes at minimum, I think would be good to hang up for the comparison exam. Here's the uh, busy reading pattern um, document. Um, so just to kind of give you a, a preview of how we're going to do this, um, we have uh, each uh, kind of structure subdivided into sections and we're going to take them uh, one at a time. And what I'm going to do is just kind of snip each one of these areas and put it at the bottom right of the screen here. And uh, from there, we'll kind of talk about uh, what, what the images look like on the, on, and what we're looking for in that specific area. Uh, now, I will say I, I tried to make this uh, reading pattern in a way that sort of is intuitive and makes sense, whereas wherever you left off, your sort of eyes are right there to look at the next structure. Uh, so if you're looking at the rotator cuff here um, and you're going to look at your subscapularis, uh, the thing that you're going to be right next door to uh, at that lesser tuberosity insertion of the subscapularis is going to be your bicep. So it's just a nice lead into looking at that structure. And once you're done looking at the biceps, the, the last part of the biceps you're going to look at is going to be the biceps labral complex, so you can start looking at the labrum. So I think that kind of makes sense and uh, is a little way, uh, just a good way to kind of think about how to look at the shoulder. Um, with that being said, I think we'll just kind of move forward and do these uh, sections one by one. But like I, I will try to give this document to you um, in word form if you, in case you want to have the actual paper. Uh, this is mostly repeating what I just said. It tends to be more of an outside in approach uh, because we're looking at the rotator cuff uh, and then we kind of go into the shoulder joint itself. Uh, but how it actually ends up working is you, you, do, you do your rotator cuff, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, subscapularis, and then the biceps and the labrum, and then all the structures of the shoulder joint itself, especially the glenohumeral ligaments, uh, the cartilage, uh, the, you know, an overall assessment of the joint. Uh, the only place I do a little jump here is to go up to the AC joint, uh, and from there we look at the AC joint and the bursa, et cetera. And then there's some you know, things we look at the end just to make sure we kind of tie it all up and make sure we look at everything on the, on the images. Uh, okay, so just starting off with the rotator cuff here. This is one of the bigger topics, uh, especially important for uh, patients that are a little bit older, uh, because often what the orthopedics are, orthopedists are going to want to know in that patient uh, population subset is especially the rotator cuff. Is there a rotator cuff tear or not? Uh, so what I've done is put up a sagittal image here, uh, just uh, showing you one way that's uh, good to start learning the anatomy. Um, you always have to know what's uh, anterior and what's posterior. Kind of just have to get used to that, but uh, we know that the subscapularis here is a more anterior structure. The infraspinatus is a teres minor. This is the more posterior shoulder. Uh, but if you uh, have this sagittal Y look through the scapula, uh, one way to uh, just uh, learn the anatomy is just to go in this um, around the clock uh, fashion and think of the mnemonic sits, uh, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, uh, teres minor, and subscapularis. Um, now, I'll, I'm going to show you how I like to look at these, but uh, we, we, we're just going to start on our coronal sequence and, and start looking at the supraspinatus at its most anterior insertional fibers. So uh, we will get started. Okay, so this is going to be the first um, uh, slide where we have actually the scrollable images. And uh, what we're going to be looking for is uh, supraspinatus. The one little caveat I'll say here is, uh, since this is a recording, I can't go back and forth like I'd like to do to really look at the anatomy the best. So I'm going to have to try to find things uh, kind of the best on their first, first try. So we'll, we'll do the best we can. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to see what um, sequence we have here. Should be a coronal. Uh, the coracoid, it kind of came here. Uh, so I think this is more of a uh, anterior to posterior approach. Um, so what, what I'm going to try to do is find the biceps. now. The biceps is, uh, is, uh, comes up in the bicipital groove, and it's a landmark I like to really point out to know where you're going to start looking for rotator cuff. Um, because what I want to do is, now this is still the biceps on uh, one image here, and I'm going to go back one more image, and I know that if I go back one more image or so, uh, and I see that uh, bone marrow uh, of the humeral head, that's going to be the greater tuberosity for the anterior most insertional fibers of supraspinatus. Uh, now, I think that the T1 without fat sat are very helpful for this because then you're going to know exactly where that bone marrow is. Uh, but somewhere around here is going to be our most anterior leading edge fibers of supraspinatus. But you do need to go back a couple more slices, and I actually went two, maybe one too far, just to know that this is uh, where our supraspinatus is going to be. Uh, okay, and, and I uh, be nice to erase things to clean it up a little bit, but um, we're going to want to look very uh, carefully here for um, all these fibers here to make sure that they look okay. So uh, we're going to just follow that back, follow that back, uh, look at our nice supraspinatus insertion here. It should be uh, mostly uh, hypo-intensive signal. 
uh, and insert, inserting nicely on the greater uh, tuberosity. We keep following it back. Uh, and at some point, the supraspinatus becomes the infraspinatus. Uh, I do describe them sometimes of ha as having a conjoined portion as well, where they just kind of come together. There's no real um, di you know, distinctor between the two. Uh, but as you work your way back to the mid to posterior aspect of the humeral head, now this arrow is going to be po pointing more at the infraspinatus, and we're going to be able to follow that all the way through. So I think it's nice to just follow that all the way through on one um, try uh, to just look on the coronal images to look at the entire supraspinatus and infraspinatus in their entirety. And once you're through the humeral uh, head, you're going to be you're going to know that you're going to be done. Uh, the second sequence that I like after I've done that, and I always have these cross reference cross reference typically to know exactly where I'm at, is going to be your sagittals because once I've uh, looked at the uh, so supraspinatus kind of in its uh, and infraspinatus in, in their longitudinal, I kind of want to look down the barrel as I kind of follow them um, from medial to lateral. Uh, so I think that's what I've uh, tried to do here. Um, oh, actually, first we're going to look at um, the uh, maybe the, this is another coronal, um, and I wanted to just show you how that marrow does look on the um, on the uh, humeral head here, um, where you can kind of see where you're going to start looking at your supraspinatus and infraspinatus and follow it through in the same way. Uh, again, with hypo intense signal and going all the way through. So wanted to show you both the coronal in. Um, the uh, PD fat sat and the T. Okay, so uh, subscapularis is going to be next. Um, so I like to start with the subscapularis on axial, uh, and then cross-reference that with my sagittal. So uh, let's let's find the uh, subscapularis here. Uh, this is the more anterior rotator cuff tendon that inserts on the lesser tuberosity. So I'm coming from high to low here, and uh, I don't want to go too far. But once we get down to this area, we're going to start looking for our lesser tuberosity and our subscapularis. Uh, which we're going to kind of start to see here. We know the muscles back here. Um, now, what slice is best to kind of land on is probably one of these, but this is all going to be the subscapularis tendon. So you want to follow that all the way through and make sure that's inserting nicely, not too thick, not, doesn't have too much increased T2 signal as it inserts on this lesser tuberosity. And we've kind of start to come out of it a little bit there, and we're seeing our biceps, which is right next door here. Uh, so that's one run through the um, subscapularis tendon. Okay, now I did put up the sagittal on this one because I want to do the cross-reference. Now, at some point, you do want to look at uh, the bulk of the musculature of the rotator cuff, especially if there's a chronic tear and you have atrophy. Um, you want to make some assessment of how, how these muscles look and make sure they're not atrophied. Um, uh, but what we're doing now is we're still looking at our subscapularis right here, which is our more anterior uh, rotator cuff muscle. And we're just going to follow this out from medial to lateral. And what I like to do is just follow it all the way out and uh, see, make sure it looks uh, okay. I'm going to bracket it here, um, and I'm just following this rotator cuff uh, tendon all the way to its uh, lesser tuberosity insertion. The whole course of it looked uh, dark, black. There was no abnormality at all, no tendinosis, no partial tear, no full thickness tear. Everything looked fine. So that is how I look at the uh, subscapularis. Uh, the general uh, terminologies that we're looking for for abnormalities of the rotator cuff is going to be uh, tendinopathy, which is a more umbrella general term, uh, but more specifically tendinosis, partial tear, and full thickness tear. And in general, tendin uh, tendinopathy or tendinosis uh, shows increased signal on T1, and the signal will also be increased on T2, but it will not be as bright as fluid signal. Because if you think it's fluid signal, um, you want to make sure you, you know, that's going to be at some degree of tear, whether that be partial or full thickness. And typically, tendinopathy will have a, a thickened tendon as well. Um, so here's an example of some mild, uh, you know, probably mild tendinosis of uh, what looks uh, likely of supraspinatus uh, where, where it has those findings. Uh, partial tear is where you have fluid signal in the tendon, but it's not completely disrupted. And this is a classic appearance of a, of a, of a tear uh, that is well known from Branton Helms um, and the real world, where it's called a rim rent tear, where you just have that small linear fluid signal at the uh, insertion of the rotator cuff that looks like this. Um, in, now, if a tear is partial thickness, it is good to describe what it, where it is exactly. Is it articular sided, is it bursal sided, or is it intrasubstance? And that basically just means can you connect this fluid signal uh, with the articular margin of the tendon along this inner surface of the tendon or with the bursal side of the tendon on the outer surface of the tendon? That is the general approach to what I try to do. Now, if it's an intrasubstance tear, that's fine, and you call it that way. No one's ever going to be able to tell you anything different because uh, it, that would not be a tear that would be able to be seen. Uh, at arthroscopy. So, um, but that would be if you only see fluid signal within the uh, substance of the tendon itself. Um, so those are the general guidelines for how we think about uh, 
partial or and full thickness tears. Now, sometimes I will say also as my last point that I do think it's hard to decide what's fluid and what's not. So it's good, I would say, to uh, one of the first things you do when you do your coronals is to decide what fluid signal it's gonna be. And for that, you're always gonna want an, an internal reference. So whether there's just a little bit of joint fluid or a little bit of fluid in the uh, bicipital groove, uh, put your eyes there and say, okay, this is what fluid is on my, on my PD fat sat or on my T2 weighted sequences. So I know that if it's gonna be that signal in the rotator cuff, that's actually what, what my tear uh, spectrum is gonna look like. Okay, here's our uh, full thickness tear. Um, this is where fluid signal uh, completely traverses the tendon from articular to bursal side. Uh, other ter uh, terms that you could describe this with is if the tendon is absent, um, if the tendon is retracted, and if it's retracted, it's always nice to describe where the, where the exact location of the tendon stump is. And then if it's a, in, on the more chronic timeline, if there's atrophy of the rotator tendon itself. Uh, but on our coronal images, and this, this is uh, especially helpful if there's a large amount of joint fluid or fluid in the, in the, in the bursa, uh, you can really find this tendon stump and it tend to, tend to find it, this to be very satisfying if you can just look at this and say exactly where it is. Um, if there's, you know, little questionable, t you know, full thickness tears and it's not very retracted, I, that's a little bit more difficult sometimes, uh, but you're really going to be able to uh, hammer this or know that this is true if you can find this retracted uh, tendon that, uh, that looks uh, something like this. Um, sub subscapularis has the same rules as the others for uh, tendinosis and tear. Um, and now as far as the subscapularis, uh, there's some other structures uh, nearby, and those structures are important in, in maintaining the ar uh, architecture of the shoulder, especially to keep the biceps uh, in the bicipital groove, um, especially the uh, transverse ligament, which, which comes across the roof of the uh, bicipital groove, um, and then the, and then the uh, subscapularis itself, which is right next door, and everything kind of comes together and keeps it right there. So if you do have an abnormal position of the biceps, uh, medial subluxation or, or a dislocation, it's going to be important to know that those other structures are probably are sh should be abnormal because uh, the, th that is what allowed this uh, dislocation or subluxation to happen. Uh, so, you know, the transverse ligament tear, fine, I, we, that does, th those words don't usually make it to our reports, uh, but we do talk about this our subscapularis articular sided versus full thickness tear that uh, can be seen to allow this uh, biceps uh, tendon to jump out uh, from the bicipital groove and, yeah, you know, sometimes be even located over here in the, uh, in the uh, glenohumeral joint itself. Um, the long head biceps tendon is uh, an important structure to evaluate. We, we look at it every single time on the um, on shoulder MRI. Um, and it has what's called an intraarticular and an extraarticular segment. Uh, so I tend to follow it, and I follow it in every uh, plane, but um, it's nice just to know that it starts in that groove, which is the extraarticular segment, and then makes kind of a turn, it makes a turn, uh, and then it goes into the uh, rotator interval in, into the intraarticular segment uh, to attach at the superior glenoid. And this is a, a picture that I thought was kind of satisfying and nice to know uh, what exactly that rotator interval is all about, what structures are in it. The main structure of the rotator interval is um, the lung head biceps tendon, and then these smaller structures form what's called the biceps pulley, the coracohumeral ligament, and uh, the uh, superior glenohumeral ligament uh, form like a sling. So at least in this example, there's a, they're showing kind of a tear of the superior glenohumeral ligament, uh, which lets this uh, biceps tendon become more inferiorly positioned than usual or, or should be in the, in the rotator interval for a biceps pulley injury. Uh, now, I think I should just back up one step here and just emphasize the rotator interval is important. You want to know what you know, you want to know what it is. You want to know what the main structures of it are, what it's bordered by. It's one of those things that I think you should learn uh, so that you can uh, interpret MRI, uh, MRI shoulder of the uh, MRI shoulders well. Um, and I think that the first thing you need to know about it is um, it's the space between the supraspinatus and the subscapularis. Uh, this is uh, going to be more of a sagittal uh, imaging approach. These, these are sagittal images down here to show you. Uh, what that is. Uh, so bordered by supraspinatus and subscapularis and the main structure is the long head biceps tendon. This is going to be the intraarticular portion of your um, of your uh, biceps tendon as you're following it in uh, the, to the shoulder joint. Okay, so now let's look at the long head biceps tendon on images on the images themselves. Um, we finished our rotator cuff and this is gonna be our next structure we're gonna look at. It uh, looks like I've done the uh, coronal here first. Uh, so uh, we're gonna to wanna to find that biceps tendon. Um, here's our subscapularis here. Now here's our biceps tendon. Now that we just wanna make sure we see it through its entire course that we can see it. Uh, it's in that bicipital groove and it makes this turn and it's gonna go this way and it's gonna, um, it's gonna uh, come across the intraarticular segment to go to the uh, shoulder uh, biceps labral complex itself. 
So uh, sometimes these are hard to see in these uh, normal studies where all the anatomy is pretty small, uh, but this is the biceps tendon that's coming in and doing that. Uh, now, it's nice to look at, the, we know this is the labrum, that's where it's going to come in and insert, uh, but it's nice to kind of pick the image that you think it really inserts. So it looks to me like it's almost inserting, and maybe the next image or so is where it will, it will insert. So here we know we have our biceps labral complex somewhere around here. Now, if we have our cross-reference up, we'll know, we'll hope this is around the 12 o'clock position of the glenoid, uh, where, where that should be. And, and that's how we follow the biceps all the way through. And we come across some more images and eventually we'll come into that posterior superior aspect of the glenoid. Now this is gonna be all labrum here. The biceps is already inserted and uh, now we're, it's just gonna be the labrum. So that's the coronal view at the long head biceps tendon. The sagittal is a nice view because especially in the intraarticular segment, you can uh, look at that rotator interval and follow up right down the barrel. Uh, so this is, uh, these are going to be our borders of the rotator interval. We're not in the rotator interval yet, but just to kind of know where your eyes can be, where you're trying to find it, is the supraspinatus and the subscapularis. So follow that through. Uh, the glenoid, so you know your clock face of the glenoid, and that's you know where you're going to know you're going to be start to, starting, you're about to go into the shoulder joint. Um, and here um, and here. Now, this is actually kind of all blending together. Um, but uh, the rotator intervals between these two muscles, and here you just see in the real world example exactly what that kind of looks like, um, where here's the biceps here, um, um, and you'll, you'll know, you'll notice that you don't really see that nice uh, superior glenohumeral ligament, coracal humeral ligament, biceps pulley. Um, really, I think a, a lot of the time you just want to find this biceps uh, to, to see that it looks normal and that it's in the normal position. But that is one run through the biceps, uh, the rotator interval, to look at the long head biceps tendon. Much more helpful if you can go on this back and forth and really look at that anatomy yourself. Um, long head bicep tendinosis has the same rules for the other tendons. Uh, thickened tendon, T, uh, T2 hyperintensity, PD fat sat hyperintensity, but not fluid signal and not absent. Uh, so inter this kind of intermediate to increased uh, signal uh, uh, finding in the biceps would be how long head bicep tendinosis looks. Um, other things that can happen in the uh, with the biceps tendon would be um, partial tears, split tears, um, and um, if there are tears of the biceps and you follow it all the way into the uh, biceps labral complex, uh, th those some of those tears can be what uh, what's part of this called slap tears. If you know, and those all have uh, their num uh, criteria as well. Um, this is, I think, uncommon. The duplicate long head biceps tendon I, I've read as possible, but I can't say that I've seen that much myself in the real world. Okay, labrum is difficult. I would say this is one of the most difficult top, topics of shoulder. I think it's one uh, one of the areas that gives the most uh, fear for really making saying you're going to see it correctly or am I going to say what the what the staff is going to think? And I think that's fine. I think that the point is that you just want to have a systematic approach for it and um, and really make your own decision and and then you can kind of get more comfortable with how the labrum should look. Uh, so just being uh, having that systematic approach is going to be very important and to do it the same way every time. Um, in general. Think about the coronal as good, uh, good plane to look for the superior and inferior, and this makes sense. You know, if, if I'm going back and forth on a coronal images, uh, that's going to make those uh, black triangles at the superior and inferior labrum profile the best. Whereas on the axial, I'm going to be more interested in the anterior and posterior. Uh, the oblique is very helpful, and uh, I'm going to show some hopefully scroll images to show that. But um, and uh, I always like to say, put up your clock face of your glenoid on your sagittal because you're going to know exactly how you're cutting across the um, oblique and to know where you're at on the glenoid and where, what part of the labrum you're in. Uh, in general, and I've heard this from multiple people at, at multiple institutions, I, 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 I it tend to be not so much emphasized on what's, what slap is this? Is this a, is this a slap seven? Uh, really just want to describe what's abnormal and what structures are involved and contiguous with your labral tear. Um, and that will be the most helpful, I think, approach overall. Um, uh, last point here is the uh, biceps anchor. Now we did run through that biceps and follow it in, and I kind of emphasize this already. It, like to pick the image where you think that the biceps inserts into the labrum, because once you start moving uh, on from that and going more posterior, if you have abnormal labrum there, that's going to be a true tear. Uh, because what we're going to go over here shortly is that uh, isolated findings to the anterior superior quadrant of the labrum tend to be much more likely uh, one of the one of the uh, normal variants, or, or uh, and I'll show you some of what those are. Uh, so here's one example of a slap, what's called a slap two tear, extending into the uh, anterior labrum. Um, and what that is, is uh, this fluid signal at the uh, chondrolabral junction of the superior labrum 
and they're showing you what's well just described as more than a recess it's too much too much fluid uh, too much uh, space um, as, as part of uh, just a couple images of a slap tear okay so let's look at the labrum uh, with all this of what we just said in mind uh, best way to look at these is on the pictures themselves so um, what do we have here first <clears throat> it looks like we have um, some axial images going from high to low um, so uh, as I said we're going to especially want to emphasize our anterior and posterior labrum um, here so this is more posterior this is more anterior this is kind of the superior part of the glenoid so as we come down we want to find these nice dark black triangles um, and just follow those down follow those down you should have several pictures where you see those until you're coming into the posterior inferior anterior inferior and uh, the labrum uh, it comes out of profile and you, you know kind of get one like peripheral look at the inferior labrum there so that is uh, how I like to look at the labrum on the axials and then on the next plane is going to be coronals um, <clears throat> um, and we already did this to kind of look at how that biceps come in uh, but and we know this is going to be more anterior so you're going to have you know this anterior labrum start to uh, profile here anterior superior anterior inferior but once you can kind of start to see these triangles you're going to know more clearly that you're in the uh, labrum itself this is that biceps coming in this is the uh, labrum near the biceps labral complex um, and uh, just really looking carefully at, to make sure we don't have fluid signal tears or paralabral cyst in, in these locations um, and uh, keep following that through now as, and, and as I said once I am at the biceps labral complex and I go more posteriorly anything I start to see now as I go more posteriorly that's going to be a true labral tear and I think that's very helpful so that's one run through the labrum uh, looking at the uh, superior and inferior labrum on those coronal images um, after you do that you can look at your um, obliques uh, really put this uh, cr cross-reference picture uh, it uses the anterior um, it goes from anterior inferior to posterior superior and if you have this picture up you're going to know exactly how this labrum is getting cut as you come across on this plane um, so that this is um this is that plane um, as you come down from uh, high uh, anterior superiorly to posteriorly inferior here uh, and I don't have the uh, you know yellow line moving for us uh, one thing uh, that you can often find is the uh, biceps coming across on like a nice pretty picture which I think I've already passed uh, but especially this labrum here is where I'm going to be looking at and the, and the posterior superior labrum to characterize slap tears better um, it, it will just tend to show things very nicely so I would I would recommend here that you get used to looking at that in that profile okay paralabral cysts very helpful finding if you can make it because that is a very good secondary evidence for a labral tear um, if you do describe it say how big it is say where it is and if it has uh, it is uh, so big that it can go immediately and impinge on uh, some what's called notches um, it may cause additional findings that are important to describe uh, so uh, the suprascapular notch and the sphenoglenoid notch are two structures to know that exist that with the suprascapular notch being more superior and the sphenoglenoid notch being more in, a little more inferior but both uh, located along the course of the suprascapular nerve and it is what inter innervates the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles uh, so this is one of those little pieces of information that if it's not totally intuitive you just kind of have to remember if you have impingement at the suprascapular notch you may get denervation changes to both supraspinatus and infraspinatus if you have um, impingement at that spinoglenoid notch uh, you have uh, potentially uh, denervation changes of only the infraspinatus uh, this picture I thought was nice to show just what some of the normal variants versus uh, actual true abnormalities of labrum are because it's a it's a very small structure that tends to be difficult to evaluate um, um, so you know P is a paralabral recess that's the biceps as it comes into the labrum that's a normal kind of area right right on the outer margin of the labrum cartilage undercutting is a, a finding you'll see often where you have kind of that smooth uh, continuation of the uh, glenoid cartilage uh, to the uh, along the um, labral junction so that's another use to get uh, uh, another look to get used to seeing um, and then the recesses the recesses of what we're, what we're going to have to talk about and I mentioned these briefly as being more located in the anterior superior labrum and it's important to know what they are now s is going to be our tear um, that's going to be a true tear and you have to decide if there's a signal abnormality going into the actual labrum itself um, so just to tell you what I think these three uh, highlighted in yellow are the first three you need to know um, as what the normal variants are um, and I just kind of break it down like this the sublabral foramen is anywhere in that anterior superior quadrant where you have a smooth recess located to that 
uh, area between the labrum and the cartilage glenoid. So, um, and then the uh, sublabial recess, on the other hand, is more localized just to that 12 o'clock position, um, but should not go into the posterior superior labrum, to emphasize that, I think, for the third time. Uh, the Buford complex is a, a normal variant to know where uh, the anterior superior labrum is deficient, so it, they're really, it's a very small or absent anterior superior labrum, uh, and it's sort of made up for physiologically by a cord-like thickened middle glenohumeral ligament, which is uh, the structure that's right in, in front of the labrum as you are scrolling on axial images, but it would be good to show you that just to uh, put pictures where uh, the words are. Uh, I really like this um, little module because it's scrollable as well. Um, this was a, uh, I think it's been several years, like 2013, but it was a, I think, a education exhibit at RSNA that uh, Stanford did, but it, it has, um, it's kind of a teaching module that has scrollable images and, and uh, labeled images. So I would recommend if you're doing this to, to uh, kind of get in here and look at that. I just did it and as of, you know, this, this recording, at least it's still working. Uh, Glenohumeral ligaments, I want to point out because there's uh, some of them that we want to look at. Uh, as far as what's the most important stabilize, uh, one of the most important external stabilizers of the shoulder, the inferior glenohumeral ligament is one to always look at, and I've highlighted that here. Uh, on the coronals, if you think about the uh, axillary pouch here, which you know is just this little fluid-containing recess of the glenohumeral joint, it's the border of that, uh, the inferior glenohumeral ligament, and it's had what's called the anterior and posterior band. So if you're scrolling anterior to posterior. Uh, know that the uh, more anterior part of that, you can say the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament, and then as you get to the more posterior, it's going to be the posterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. Uh, this is one of the areas that we're going to look at when we talk about adhesive capsulitis, and I'm going to show you an example of what that is. But if this is too thick and, uh, uh, and uh, T2 hyper intense, that'll be one of the findings for that entity. The middle glenohumeral ligament is a structure as you're scrolling anaxials. It's going to be right in front of the mid labrum. And the superior glenohumeral ligament, we've already touched on briefly as part of that rotator interval. This is a much smaller structure that I think it would be hard to see specifically on every single case. Uh, so here's the picture of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. And here's the pictures of a couple of the others. Uh, the middle glenohumeral ligament, I'll point out, because I, this is not seen on every shoulder just based on uh, anatomic variants. But uh, you know your landmark here can be your anterior labrum. And if you just look right in front of there, you should find this uh, structure, this uh, ligament that is the uh, middle glenohumeral ligament. Here's an example of where I would expect to find the superior glenohumeral ligament if I can. Uh, you know, if you're on an axial and you're kind of at the base of the coracoid here um, and your anterior labrum is coming in, it'll be one of these uh, smaller ligaments right here. Okay, and this might be some scroll images just to, sh just to show some of that. Um, looks like this is a coronal. Um, so what we're looking for is the uh, glenohumeral ligaments. Here's our humeral head. Uh, keep scrolling here, um, and we'll see how it, well it shows on this case, but we're going to be looking down here uh, for this uh, black ligament along the inferior aspect of the glenohumeral joint, uh, which I probably should not uh, cover up when I'm showing it to you. Uh, here it's shown a little bit better. Um, and this will be the anterior band. And then you keep going, keep going, keep going. Eventually, it's the posterior band. So, you know, not, not a very big structure, at least on this picture, uh, on this patient. But uh, that's what the uh, in, uh, inferior glenohumeral ligament looks at, one area we always look at. And on the axials, um, maybe try to find uh, especially that middle glenohumeral ligament. And I said that should be right in front of the anterior labrum here. We have our subscapularis here, too. But it's, uh, you know, everything is very close together here. But this is still a normal case. Uh, where you have your uh, what should be the middle glenohumeral ligament right in front of anterior to the uh, anterior labrum. Okay, here's what adhesive capsulitis looks like. I do feel like this sometimes is a little bit of a hedgy finding, uh, but and if you can see it with more uh, confidence, it, it's just more satisfying when it's a, a case like this. Uh, this is um, a, a coronal T2 or uh, fat sat or PD fat saturated image where the uh, inferior glenohumeral ligament does not look like what we just looked like, that nice, uh, you know, thinner, dark structure. This is thick uh, and T2 hyper intense. Uh, and that's going to be one of the main findings of adhesive capsulitis. Now, we will just say, because we didn't um, look at it specifically, though, if the other place after I look at the axillary recess for adhesive capsulitis is going to be the rotator interval. Um, so if you just don't see the biceps well, if there's just kind of intermediate density, synovitis, and thickening in that area, those are the two areas to make this finding. Uh, adhesive capsulitis is a, is a clinical diagnosis, but these are the imaging findings that support it. Thickening, synovitis, in the axillary recess, and the rotator interval of the joint. 
Okay, now we're going to get uh, into the last things we want to evaluate uh, the glenohumeral joint that we haven't done yet, and that's going to be cartilage. Um, I always like to say, just remember that the cartilage of the humeral head goes all the way kind of around the superior aspect of the humeral head, but you're going to want to look at the glenoid as well and try to just decide how deficient it, if it, it is at all. Don't overcall things that you don't see, but if you really see a focal defect, like in this case, <clears throat> you can talk about that you have some high-grade chondromalacia at that, at that area. And at least on this case, they're uh, describing this as uh, chondrolysis with uh, a, an intraarticular chondral fragment. Um, this is also, I think, going to be your chance to assess your overall degree of degenerative changes or degenerative joint disease in the glenohumeral joint. Uh, you can look to make sure things are normally aligned. Uh, but this is going to be where I'm kind of looking for my little humeral head osteophytes. It can be a, a finding often seen in, in glenohumeral arthritis, uh, just to give myself a sense of how bad overall I think this arthritis is. And, I'm, and I'll probably try to say that in my report as well. Okay, so let's scroll on some images of the glenohumeral joint. <clears throat> Again, thinking about uh, cartilage, uh, looks like I put it up an axial first. Um, and my attention here now is going to be mostly on the humeral head, uh, the cartilage glenoid. This is a nice, normal, beautiful, intermediate signal cartilage throughout the joint, normal glenohumeral alignment, um, and just following that through and looking at all those things as normal. Also like to do this on coronal. Uh, look at the uh, humeral cartil head cartilage all the way around. Um, and again, just nice, normal uh, alignment and cartilage all the way throughout. No significant degenerative change. Normal. Uh, AC joint is next. Uh, what, what, uh, same kind of principles. Want to look at the overall degree of degenerative changes and um, any, any secondary effects, and especially mass effect on traversing supraspinatus. Uh, one theory is that you know, mass effect and impingement on that is, uh, is a predis predisposition to rotator cuff tears. So I at least try to say if I see mass effect uh, on the supraspinatus from the AC arthritis, I do, I do tend to say that. Uh, but here's some example of AC arthritis <clears throat> with a um, full thickness supraspinatus tear. You'll see here we don't have any normal looking uh, rotator cuff tendon. Uh, potentially this is the uh, retracted tendon here, but you'd have to kind of look at all the images to know. Uh, but if you don't see tendon where it should be, this is the subacromial space. This is the insertional area. Um, that's going to be, again, what you want to look for for a rotator cuff tear. Um, other findings that can be seen in this area would be something like disoclavicular osteolysis or stress fracture, subchondral fracture. Um, so just look, you know, at your fluid sensitive images, see if there's edema, see if there's any, you know, linear hypo intense signal abnormality to make findings like that. Um, so here we can look at that on some actual images. Looks like it's a coronal. Uh, so now my attention is up here on this uh, AC joint <coughs> here, uh, and it looks fine. Don't see any significant arthritis, and at least on this case, it looks normal. A chromium configuration uh, maybe got more sway previously. Um, I, I, at least here, we don't uh, seem, to, seem to emphasize this on every single case, uh, but it's a descriptive finding uh, named for how the uh, chromium looks on sagittal MRI. And you have your different types, flat undersurface, <clears throat> curved undersurface, hook, so the hook uh, hooking of the acromion thought to be potentially more uh, related to impingement or uh, other problems. And then four is the convex or upturn. So it has uncertain clinical re uh, relevance overall. Other things you can describe would be anterior or lateral downsloping, um, depending on what plane you're looking at the acromion. Uh, bursae. A uh, couple bursae I want to emphasize, the subacromial subdeltoid bursa and the subcoracoid bursa. Whoops, I crossed it out. Um, but definitely the subacromial subdeltoid. If you look at your rotator cuff coming across and then your deltoid is your uh, muscle that's going to be on top of it, uh, it's a potential space where you can have fluid um, and uh, a bursitis. Now, if you have a rotator cuff tear, by definition, fluid goes from the glenohumeral joint into the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. So finding communication of fluid between those two structures is a nice finding to be able to say, yes, I do have a full thickness rotator cuff tear here. The subcoracoid bursa is located in front of the subscapularis muscle on sagittal. This is a picture that I think nicely shows that. Um, now, the, the uh, normal variant to know here is that this is the joint space here. Um, this is going to be a fusion or, uh, you know, probably an effusion. Uh, but the subscapularis recess pooches right over the top of the um, subscapularis muscle, my, my, uh, myotendinous junction. It does have a little border here. So this is all just joint effusion. Now, if you have another fluid space uh, in, in front of the subscapularis muscle it's, itself, that's a, uh, a subcoracoid bursitis. So if you make that finding, you can use that term. Um, after that, we are getting near the end of our study. We want to look at a few other things. 
um, and I do a run through the bones and soft tissues to make sure there's nothing else that I haven't seen yet, um, especially in my fluid sensitive images. Uh, some examples of either uh, anatomic variants or, or bone lesions, an enchondroma uh, would be a benign chondroid lesion uh, with T2 hyperintensity, uh, finding like osochromial <clears throat> on the uh, cholder here uh, where we see that synchondrosis here something like an incidental chest wall does want you know just something else you want to always look at the edges of, of the film or uh, edges of the images to make sure we don't miss anything else look at the marrow look at look for masses look for fractures things like that okay and that that's actually all for this so hopefully if you watch this and get some practice with that use the reading pattern you're going to be able to hit the ground running in the uh, in the uh, bone room on the uh, shoulder MRIs uh, so the last thing we have here is our scrollable images to look at um, if you want all these structures yourself, uh, first being the coronal T1, next being the coronal PD fat sat, coronal T2 without fat sat. I didn't talk about this too much, but this is a nice uh, sequence to you know support your findings of tendinosis and partial thickness tear <clears throat> on uh, on the rotator cuff, and we use it in other areas as well. But you'll notice here, this is one of the at least here the only times we get a T2 weighted image without fat sat. Um, so you'll notice the fat on the here is, you know, a little bit bright. It, it's also bright. Uh, T fat is bright on T1 and T2 if you don't sat it out. Here is our axial PD fat sat. And here is our sagittal T2. And finally, our oblique. And I don't think I showed the biceps that well on the first time through, but just to kind of show you, it's always a nice picture I like to find. Look at that biceps coming across. It's always usually nice to see that doing that. All right, good luck in the bone room with shoulder.